thanks everyone um, for coming today. Um, like I said, if you came in a little bit late and you want a copy of these slides, feel free to scan that QR code or go to that URL um, there to get a copy. Um, before I do anything else, I have to acknowledge um, the members of my lab group. Um, we call ourselves the Phyletica Lab. Um, not that they had a choice in that matter, but um, uh, I've been a really fortunate to recruit um, an outstanding group of uh, talented young scientists, and they've really made all the work that I'm going to be talking about today possible, and they've made it a lot of fun, too. Um, and as John alluded to, the work in our lab is very diverse, ranging from taxonomy to phylogeography, speciation, genomics, conservation genomics. Um, but today, I'm really going to focus on uh, sort of a common theme of research um, in our group uh, that's been funded over the past four years by NSF. And the goal of this is to relax an assumption um, that current methods make in phylogenetics that will allow us to sort of better interrogate the processes that you know, give rise to all the amazing biodiversity of our planet. Uh, so really to get at that mystery of mysteries. All right. And so I'm extremely biased, uh, but I think it's a very exciting time to be a phylogeneticist. Um, shared ancestry is a fundamental property of all life on our planet. Um, and phylogenetics is becoming the statistical foundation because of that. It actually provides a way of modeling that shared ancestry. Uh, there's lots of big data coming online, and this is just creating a lot of challenges and opportunities to create new ways of interrogating biological questions from a phylogenetic perspective. And we've come a long ways in the last 40 years in phylogenetics. There's a huge um, volume of models that allow us to approach um, biological questions, uh, but they all make a limiting assumption. And that assumption is that uh, all lineages diverge independently from one another. And so what I mean by that is if we look at this ancestral species of lizard here, whatever process caused it to diverge at this point, we assume that process can have no effect on any of the other lineages across the tree, right? And so that's a pretty strong assumption and there's a lot of reasons why we might expect that to be violated. So here's an example. So let's use an example of three species of lizards I like lizards, co-occurring on an island. I also like islands. And we can imagine that at, um, at some point sea levels rise and fragment that island, causing all three species to diverge, right? That's causing a shared divergence um, and clearly violating the assumption of independent divergences across the tree. Um, and we can imagine sea levels uh, rise further, causing another bout of shared divergences, okay? So that's a sort of a biogeographic example of processes that can um, cause shared divergences across the phylogeny, but there are other processes as well. So instead of lizards on islands, we can imagine that these are three members of a gene family on a region of a chromosome that gets duplicated. Right? That is also gonna cause uh, a, share, a pattern of shared divergence, divergences like that. Um, we can also imagine that these are three individuals carrying a pathogen uh, that they bring to a social gathering and spread to other individuals. That is going to create a shared divergence pattern in the phylogenetic history of the pathogen. And just more generally, whenever we have organisms living inside of other organisms, uh, we have opportunities to create these shared divergences um, across the tree of life. Okay, so why should we care about this? Um, why should we worry about these um, possible processes that generate shared divergences? Well, doing so, first of all, might improve inference. So if the true history of our group looks something like this, or the true history of whatever system we're working on looks something like this, the current phylogenetic methods that we use are assuming a model that looks more like this. With nine tips, they assume eight independent bifurcating divergences, which in this case is over-parameterized, right? There is really only three events here. And we're using eight parameters to try to explain them. Um, so we're introducing unnecessary error into our analysis. Um, so we want to avoid that. <clears throat> but what I'm more interested in is by accommodating shared divergences in the phylogenetic inference, we can create a, a general statistical framework for being able to test the patterns predicted 
by interesting patterns of diversification, uh, interesting processes of diversification. So just going back to this slide, what I'm saying here is I think these processes are really interesting and I wanna be able to test the prediction um, that they make. Our current assumption of independent divergences doesn't allow us to do that. So that's what we wanna, that's the problem that we wanna solve. Okay, so roadmap for the rest of this talk. I'm gonna talk about three different approaches my lab group has taken at, at getting at this problem. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit where, uh, about where I see this uh, work going in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, first introduce a pairwise approach that we took. I'll take uh, a little bit of an aside to talk about a related problem uh, regarding population demography rather than divergences. And then I'll talk about a fully phylogenetic approach um, that we've recently um, uh, uh, taken to this problem. Okay, so first the pairwise approach. So to keep things simple, what we did is we said, okay, let's just ignore the overall phylogeny and just look at pairs of populations, right? And what we wanna do is just say, you know, did they diverge at the same time or not, okay? We obviously don't wanna assume this model a priori. Um, we have to consider other possibilities, right? So for example, the first population of lizards, the second pair or the third pair of lizard populations could have diverged independently of the other two. So that's three additional models we have to account for. And a fifth possible model with uh, three pairs of population is that they all diverged independently of one another, okay? So what we wanna be able to do is we wanna be able to infer which of these five possible models best explains the genetic data that we have sampled from the populations of organisms, okay? And more specifically is I wanna make probability statements about these models. And we can do that if we take a Bayesian approach to this problem. And so the posterior probability of a given model is proportional to the likelihood of that model times the prior, prior probability of that model, okay? That looks relatively simple, but this likelihood here is not a simple likelihood density, it's a marginal likelihood, okay? And it looks like this, so the probability, the likelihood of the model or the probability of the data given the model is an average over the entire space of the model, okay? So it's an, it's an integral, but you can just think of it as an average. We're averaging the likelihood over the entire space of the model, and we're weighting that average by the priors that we have on the, on the parameters of the model, okay? So it's a weighted average, and the weighting is coming from the priors, the prior probability distributions that we put on the parameters of the model. Don't worry about this too much, but the fact that this is a weighted average is going to become important, important a, little bit, uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so this looks relatively simple, but unfortunately, this theta symbol is actually representing a lot of parameters, okay? So we're gonna be collecting genetic data from these populations. We have to model how those uh, characters evolve, and those characters are gonna evolve along gene trees or genealogies within the population and how those gene trees branch is determined by de demographics of population. So to get at these divergence times, we need a lot of other parameters that we have to um, incorporate into our model. This creates a lot of challenges, especially all of these gene trees, okay? So the likelihood is actually tractable. We can um, derive the, the likelihood density um, of this model, but the gene trees are really difficult to deal with computationally. Okay, and um, we have to uh, put a, a distribution over all possible models and sample over those models. All right, and that can get uh, difficult quickly. So with only three pairs of populations, it's a trivial problem, there's only five models. But when we have 10 pairs, it's over 115,000 models, and with 20 pairs, we're up to over 51 trillion models that are possible. Um, so it's, the, the problem explodes pretty quickly. Okay, due to these challenges, um, this inference problem has been largely restricted to approximate methods. So approximate Bayesian computation, which use simulations to avoid you know, doing anything with the likelihood, okay? But my prior work in my PhD and in my postdoc, uh, what I found is that these ABC methods or approximate Bayesian computation methods don't actually perform very well for this particular model choice problem. So we need a different approach. <clears throat> And so what we did in my lab group is we developed a new method and we called it Ecoavality. Um, 
And the goal here is we want to do a full likelihood Bayesian method, but we want it to be fast and we want to use genome scale data. Okay. And we're going to do that by taking advantage of some really nice mathematical work by David Bryant and colleagues that allows us to analytically integrate over all of the gene trees, all possible gene trees and all possible mutational histories along those gene trees. We integrate all that out when we calculate the likelihood, right? And then that allows us to do our, uh, we don't have to deal with those gene trees in our computational machinery, um, which is great. <laughs> All right, and we're going to use a Dirichlet process prior to place the probability on all possible models. And then we're going to use Gibbs sampling, which is a Bayesian approach that allows us to, we don't have to actually sample all the models, we just have to sample the models that are, you know, explain the data well. And so this allows us to let the data decide which models are important. Okay, so this is how we're going to be able to do this. All right, so does it work? So first thing we did, simulate lots of data, apply the method to those simulated data sets and see how it works. All right, and so what we're looking at here is a bunch of simulations where we know the true divergence time, and we're looking at how well we estimate that time. And this looks pretty good, right? We want it to fall along the one-to-one -one line. It does. There are 95% credibility intervals here. They're just really tiny, um, but they're not too small because they're actually covering the truth 95% of the time, which is the exact frequentist behavior that we want. So that looks great. Um, in terms of estimating how um, the divergence model, how these um, pairs are grouped together, it's also doing quite well. So this is the true number of events. We had three possible pairs. Um, and we're estimate, if we estimate well, um, all of our simulation replicates should fall along the diagonal. And most of them are. 97% um, of the time they are, and we have a high posterior confidence in that correct answer. So that looks good. All right, so let's compare this to the ABC approaches. So these are two ABC methods. I'm looking at true versus estimated divergence times. We're much more accurate and precise with our full likelihood Bayesian approach than these uh, approximate approaches in estimating the divergence times. And the same is true for estimating the divergence models or the number of divergence events. So what we can see is these ABC methods are very prone to sort of lumping things together when they shouldn't be. So even when the true number of events is three, it's very likely to estimate that, some, that there was a share, at least one shared divergence event. Um, we're doing much better with our full likelihood Bayesian approach. <clears throat> all right, and if we look at the average runtime across all these simulations, um, it's about 30 minutes for our new approach, where it's over four days um, for the approximate approaches. So that is also a welcome uh, uh, result as well. And so these methods are basically avoiding calculating the likelihood um, by doing tons of simulations. And that's why it can take um, so long. <clears throat> all right. So all of this work was really motivated by a particular question about the biogeography of Southeast Asia. Um, and that question is, um, so first of all, this, this is what Southeast Asia looks like today, but during, <clears throat> excuse me, during glacial periods, it looks something more like this. Sea levels were much lower, much more land was exposed um, across the Sunda Shelf and other areas. <clears throat> if you want to see an animation of the last 400,000 years of Southeast Asia, the sea level animation, go ahead and scan this QR code um, and that'll take you there. Um, so this was happening repeatedly, right? So every time there was a glacial period, Southeast Asia looked something more like this. An interglacial period would come, sea levels would rise, and it would fragment the landscape, All right? And so this begs the question, did this repeated fragmentation of the landscape, did it promote diversification? It's long been assumed in sort of the biogeographic literature that these interglacial um, fragmentations sort of drove a species pump, that there's this, that about the speciation was happening every time we had an interglacial period. Um, but we want to actually test that. If that's correct, what we should see when we look at divergence times of taxa across this region, we should see divergence times that are clustered and, and correspond with the interglacial period when the islands were fragmented. So that's exactly what we want to look for. And so what we did is we um, sampled eight pairs of populations of bent-toed geckos, that's the Certodactylus genus, 
and um, eight pairs of populations of the gecko genus, sampled from across the Philippine Islands, and we collected genomic data from them. <clears throat> we applied our new approach to this, and remember that if um, that sort of interglacial um, species pump hypothesis is correct, we should see a sort of a small number of events, right? Things should be clustered together in terms of when they diverge, but we see the exact opposite. So the dark bars here are showing you the posterior probability for all possible numbers of events. And we have strong support for all eight pairs diverging independently of one another. So no shared divergences. And this is just a marginal posterior distribution of the divergence time, the mutation scale divergence times. Um, of all eight pairs of population. So it looks relatively random. It doesn't look like they're grouping together in any way. Um, I won't show you the results for the gecko genus because they're very similar. We see, once again, strong support for independent divergences. All right, and that's support against that climate-driven species pump hypothesis. And this can make, this does make sense sort of in light of the natural history of these lizards. Um, something like dispersal via rafting on vegetation might be more important than whether the islands are actually connected um, or not. <clears throat> and um, the full likelihood Bayesian approach um, based on the simulations is faster and more accurate than the ABC approaches. All right. And so that we also want to compare our full likelihood Bayesian approach to the ABC approach with the actual real data. We had to sort of scale down our data set to three pairs and a relatively small number of loci to do this because of the computational limitations of these simulation-based approaches. But when we do that, we see a very stark contrast, right? So our full likelihood Bayesian method, strong support for independent divergences, but the ABC method has very strong support that all three pairs of populations diverge at the same time. However, there's a huge amount of uncertainty of when that divergence time happens. Right? And that should make you go, huh, right? So uh, not to anthropomorphize model behavior too much, but what this model is saying is like, yep, absolutely certain that they all diverge at the same time. But when we ask it, when did that happen? It's like, ah, I don't really know. That doesn't really make sense, right? And so what we wanted to do is sort of interrogate why we see this behavior. And we see this a lot with these ABC methods that they want to tend to group things together. <clears throat> So that question motivated um, a PhD student in my lab, Kerry Cobb, Adam Lachey and Vladimir Minin and I to write a review paper sort of interrogating that question. And I don't have time to get into this, um, but the long story short, it all comes down to those average likelihoods, right? In a, in a Bayesian model choice, it's really the average likelihoods that matter. And we're averaging those models um, and we're weighting that average by those divergence time um, priors. And so if those priors are really diffuse, it creates a really strong penalty against adding divergence time parameters to the model, okay? So that's really what's going on here. Um, as far as we can tell, you can read more about it here. Kerry also developed a really nice uh, interactive web page to accompany the paper. Um, so you can check that out um, there as well. All right. Um, another question that uh, my lab group has been working on this, that sort of follows this, um, follows this work is, you know, I, we, we use the Dirichlet process prior over all possible models, but is that the best prior? It's the only one we chose. Um, so we really wanted to explore other possible models to see if, if, if there are better ones. Um, this work was led by PhD student Tashitsa Ananza in my lab. But uh, PhD students Tanner Myers, Randy Klobaka, Claire Tracy, Kerry Cobb, and Matt Bueller were all involved, as well as my um, a postdoc, uh, Perry Wood. And so what we did is we developed two additional priors over divergence models, <clears throat> simulated a bunch of data, and uh, compared them. The good news is they all perform quite well, um, but uh, pittman your process does seem to have a slight advantage over the Tereshley process. I won't get into the details, but it's just the pittman your process is a generalization of the uh, Dirichlet process. It has an extra parameter, which gives it a bit more flexibility, um, which is why I think uh, it's able to um, work in this model choice problem a little bit better. <clears throat> Another question we've been exploring is, what about smaller data sets? So the full likelihood Bayesian approach, equal that we developed, 
is really designed for genomic data and sort of smaller data sets where we'll only have one or a handful of loci uh, from the genome actually violates some of the assumptions it makes about um, sort of how ancestry is shared across the genome. Okay? But we wanted to see, you know, even though it, um, these smaller data sets violate that assumption, how well does it perform? So we did a bunch of simulations to test that, and we compared it to an ABC method that is actually designed for these smaller data sets. Um, and so there's no model violations here. And what we can see is even with a data set as small as one 500 base pair locus, our genomic, our, our full likelihood method that's designed for genomic data is already doing better. And its performance increases much more quickly as we add those sides. So this is exciting because there's a bunch of legacy data sets that we can go back and reevaluate um, with the new approach. <clears throat> all right. All right, so everything that I've talked about so far is available online. I'm a very strong proponent of open science. So all of the work that we do, we use version control to keep track of every step that's um, recorded in real time online in open science notebooks. Um, and I'm just going to show you quickly uh, one example of, of one of these notebooks. And what we do is we actually keep documentation as part of the notebook that can be rendered as HTML and served as a project website. Okay, so if you scan this QR code or go to this um, URL, uh, you will find this website here. And this is just one example of one of these um, project websites. Um, and it's really nice. It you know, provides a lot of background about the motivation um, for the project. Uh, it provides a lot of background in terms of how to acquire the skills that are necessary to work on these computational projects. This has been really important for getting students involved, especially undergraduates involved in these projects um, where they can actually just, you know, before they even get started, just go through these tutorials and kind of get up to speed. Um, and then, um, when they actually get to the analyses, they can sort of follow along and do these. So this has been really good for collaboration across the lab group, but it's also great for repeatability, right? So, you know, why read the method section of the paper that comes from this when you can actually go, you know, you can live the method, method section, just go to this URL and you can actually see what, exactly what we did step-by-step. Step. <clears throat> All right. All right, so let's take a little bit of an aside to a related problem. So instead of looking at population divergences, let's look at changes in population size, the demographic changes. So recently there's been a lot of interest in looking for shared um, population um, size changes across populations. And that makes sense, right? There's a lot of interesting ecological and biogeographic questions that you could approach by being able to test for this. <clears throat> and there's been several nice um, approximate Bayesian computation approaches developed for this uh, inference problem. One of them was applied to genomic data from five populations of sticklebacks, and they found really strong support, 99% uh, posterior probability, that all five uh, populations co-expanded at the same time. Okay? But this is a really tricky inference problem, and the reason that is, is what we're trying to estimate, which is the timing and magnitude of a population size change, it could become unidentifiable in three ways. Um, so the information that we're getting from our data about a population size change has to do with the rate of drift or looking backwards in time, the rate at which um, uh, gene copies find their ancestors or coalesce, right? And so when the population size is large, that rate of coalescence is slow. When the population size is small, that rate of coalescence is fast. And so it's that difference at different times that is providing the information that we're trying to estimate here. But if that, if that change is too old, we run out of coalescent events. If it's too young, we don't have any coalescence events. And if the magnitude is not large, um, the difference in rate is gonna be very hard to identify. Okay, so it's a tricky inference problem. And the ABC approaches wanna, seem to wanna lump things together once again. So what we wanted to do is very similar to when we were looking at divergences, but now we want to look at changes in population size. So from genomic data, can we estimate uh, the timing of these changes and whether they're shared across populations? 
And so this was work done um, uh, in collaboration with a summer REU student, a, a REU student, student over the summer, uh, Nadia Albahi. So she was funded off an REU supplement off my NSF grant, but it worked out really great because she was able to piggyback off of the Comp Bio um, REU uh, run by Les and others in the department. So it was, uh, it, was, it was really nice. And Carrie Cobb was involved in this work as well. And so what we wanted to do is, is um, basically most of the machinery was already in equality to do this. We just had to tweak some of, or modify some of our algorithms that we could do this with population size changes. Run a bunch of simulations, see how well it performs, and apply it to that stickleback genomic data and see what we find. Okay, simulation results. So what we did is we simulated a bunch of uh, data sets where there were six comparisons. Three of them were pairs of populations that diverged, and three of them were um, single populations that either con expanded or contracted. Okay. And this is just showing us that after we analyzed the results, we looked at the results differently for the population pairs that diverged over here and the, um, pair, uh, and the populations that um, experienced a size change. What we can see is we do really well at estimating the timing and sort of the sharing of divergence times, but we are much less successful at doing this with the population size change, um, which is exactly what we expected from theory, right? Is that this is a difficult thing to estimate um, because of the um, unidentifiability problems. So then we applied this to the uh, genomic data from those five Alaskan populations of sticklebacks. And what this is showing is um, the, the Resurrection Bay population in the past was much smaller than it is presently. And that's true for all five populations. Okay. So this is confirming that there was a large expansion in the um, effective population size. This is mutation scaled effective population size um, for all five populations, which is what the ABC methods found. So we sort of corroborated that. However, we found really strong support that um, all of them expanded at different times. They didn't all do, um, expand at the same time. So once again, we seem to be running into this problem where these approximate Bayesian computation methods uh, are tending to lump things together um, when perhaps they shouldn't be. All right, so once again, everything uh, to do with that project, all the minutia is available at, in this open science notebook if you're interested. All right, so now we get to the fully phylogenetic approach to this problem. And this is work uh, that I did in collaboration with a uh, postdoc in my lab, um, Perry Wood, who was funded off the NSF, um, uh, NSF grant to do this work. <clears throat> All right, so let's just kind of refresh our memory here. What's the motivation again? Okay, so what we talked about is there's all these really interesting biological processes that predict shared divergence time. And we want to sort of develop a general statistical framework for being able to test for those predictions. That's our ultimate goal here. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is really sort of um, change the way that we um, approach uh, phylogenetic inference, expand the space of trees that we're going to consider during phylogenetic inference. To show you an example of this, let's assume that we're interested in four species, just because the number of trees is small and I can fit it on a slide. Okay, so with four species, current methods for estimating a rooted tree would consider these 15 possible tree models or topologies, right? And all of them have three independent bifurcating divergences, all right? But there are other possible tree models out there that we could allow onto the playing field, right? That we could consider during phylogenetic inference. And those are models with fewer divergence time parameters that allow for shared divergence time and for multifurcating divergences. Right, so we're going to relax that assumption of independent bifurcating divergences by expanding the set of trees that we're going to, going to allow during phylogenetic inference. Okay, so that's great. But the first thing we have to do is we have to put a statistical distribution over this expanded tree space. Tree space. A distribution like this never existed because no one's really approached um, phylogenetics in this way 
um, previously. So we had to come up with a distribution over this expanded space. To do that, we assumed all of those tree models are equally probable a priori. We put a parametric distribution on the age of the root. Um, and then we use scaled beta distributions for all the other divergence times. Okay, and one thing I do want to point out here is when we were only looking at pairs of populations, there was really no sort of um, natural constraint to those divergence times. And so when we had to sort of average the, the likelihood of those models um, with respect to the prior, the problem was is those. Those, those priors could put a lot of weight out in unreasonable regions of parameter space. Here, now that we have a phylogenetic structure, we're sort of imposing natural limits on that. And it should help avoid that problem of those priors creating a strong weight um, and causing us to lump things together too often. All right, so now we've got a distribution over this expanded tree space. Now we need to do inference with it. Um, so we took a Bayesian approach to this problem and a Bayesian model averaging approach. And we did that using reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is just some um, um, computational machinery that's going to allow us to sort of sample among different trees that have different numbers of divergence time parameters. I'm going to completely gloss over the details of this because they're very hairy, um, but I will sort of convince you that it works. Um, so this, we did a lot of validation tests. This is one of those tests where we uh, did a test with a tree with seven tips, and we set up the test so that if the algorithm is working correctly, the number of times each possible tree is sampled should follow a binomial distribution, and we see that our MC-MC samples do very nicely. So um, our, we didn't screw up in actually implementing our algorithms is what that's telling us. Okay. So we implemented um, this generalized tree distribution and sort of the Bayesian machinery for sampling it in a new tool called PhiCoEval, um, which is part of the EcoEvality software package. And we're going to couple this generalized tree distribution with a likelihood, once again, um, that's thanks to some nice mathematical work by David Bryant and colleagues that allows us to integrate over all the gene trees when we calculate the likelihood. But I do want to point out that um, the tree model is completely independent from the likelihood. And so we're coupling it with this likelihood here because it's very useful for the problems that we want to approach. But this could be coupled with any likelihood function that calculates the probability of any type of data on a tree. Okay, so this is really a truly general approach to this problem. Okay. Um, so the goal here is we want to be able to co-estimate the phylogeny, shared divergences, multi-forgetting multi divergences, all from genome scale data. So can we do that? Well, the first thing we're going to do is simulations. So we simulated 100 data sets, each with uh, 50,000 base pairs on these two trees here. So one with shared and multi-forgetting divergences and one with only independent um, bifurcating divergences. We then analyze all 200 data sets with our new approach and sort of the current standard, right? A model assuming independent bifurcating divergence. We repeated uh, the same thing where instead of simulating the data on these two fixed trees, we randomly draw the topology and the branch lengths from these two distributions. And then we simulate data on them. And then we use, uh, apply these methods to those data. Okay, so let's look at some results. So we're looking at um, 100 replicate data sets that we simulated on this tree. And here we're looking at a histogram of the posterior probability um, of, for example, these two are showing us the histogram of the posterior probability of correctly inferring this shared divergence time. And this is showing the histogram for this shared divergence time. So, and also for the multiplication. So what we're seeing here is that we're consistently getting high posterior probability for correctly inferring um, shared divergences and multiplication, which is exactly what we want to see. All right, so we're going to look at the same result. So I'm just moving that tree off to the left. Um, but now we're going to look at um, how, how likely are we to sort of incorrectly resolve this multiplication, okay? 
And so what we see is that the sort of current methods that assume independent bifurcating um, trees are susceptible to what's called the star tree paradox. They can actually quite strongly support a branch or a, a relationship that's not there. Um, but the generalized model avoids that. So it never strongly supports um, a sort of a, a resolution of this um, an incorrect relationship that resolves that polytomy. All right, we can also just look at how far we are from the true tree, right? And so here is our new approach, sort of the current standard. Um, and we want to be as close to zero as possible, right? We want to be as close to the truth as possible. And with these simulations, we are doing significantly better. So when there are shared divergences, um, we're doing significantly better with our new approach. Okay, but what if there isn't? What, right? what if the tree has only bifurcating independent divergences? Well, in that case, both methods do really well. <clears throat> we always get strong posterior support for the correct topology. And if we look at distance from the true tree, they're indistinguishable, right? So there's no cost to using our generalized approach, even if there are, um, all the divergences are independent and bifurcating, which is exactly what we want to see. And it's sort of what we expect based on theory, because this model, this independent bifurcating model, is a special case it's nested within our generalized model. Okay, so what about those random trees? When we randomly draw a generalized tree and randomly draw the diver uh, divergence times and then simulate data. Well, in that case, we do a really good job of estimating the total length of the tree. Um, and when there are shared divergence times, we generally it correctly infer them uh, with, with high posterior probability. So that looks good. Um, so <clears throat> even on random trees with shared divergences, we're doing a pretty good job, or doing quite a good job of uh, estimating um, these shared divergences. Okay, so what about random trees that have independent bifurcating uh, divergences? This allows us to assess sort of the false positive rate of our new method. So how often does it incorrectly merge together divergences that are truly independent? Um, and so what we did is we looked at that. Um, so this is showing us sort of a violin plot for the posterior probability of incorrectly merging together divergence times. And what we can see is less than 5% of the time do we have support over um, a posterior probability of over 50%. So a relatively low false positive rate of less than 5%, which is really good. And what's good is when we do sort of incorrectly support um, shared divergences, what we see is the difference in time between those divergences is really small. Okay, so what we wanna see is a nice L-shaped distribution. So when we do incorrectly support shared divergences, it's because those times are actually very close together. And that's exactly what we see. All right, so we've got a low false, false positive rate. <clears throat> One really surprising result um, that I was happy to see is that the generalized approach actually improves um, the behavior of the computational machinery, so the MCMC convergence and mixing. This was not a guarantee at all because right, we expanded tree space. So there's a lot more possible trees to consider, but we also created new ways of being able to move through that tree space. And that seems to be more important than the overall space. We're actually able to improve um, convergence and mixing of the MCMC chain. I was very happy to see that because I, I didn't know what to expect on, uh, um, for that. <clears throat> okay, so back to this question. Did the repeated fragmentation of the landscape in Southeast Asia, did that promote diversification? So we wanted to take our new approach um, and, and assess this once again. So we sampled populations of bent-toed geckos from across the Philippines and um, populations of gecko um, from across the Philippines and collected RADSeq data, so loci from across their genomes. And we applied our new fully phylogenetic approach to this problem to see what we find. All right, so let's look at gecko first. Here's a time scale of when divergences are happening. So this is the Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene, and Oligocene. This is showing us the number of divergence times, the posterior probability, right? And so the current methods that we use assume that there are 25 um, independent bifurcating divergences 
our results are, are sort of resoundingly excluding that possibility, showing that there is you know, benefit to generalizing the space of trees. Okay, so what we're finding is weak to moderate support for um, five shared um, divergence times and some multifurcating divergences as well across uh, the gecko phylogeny. Very similar results we're seeing with bentoed geckos. So we're getting uh, moderate to strong support for five shared divergence times in the Pleistocene and the late Pliocene, um, which is exactly what the um, sort of species pump hypothesis predicts, that these interglacial, uh, repeated interglacial fragmentation uh, of the landscape is sort of generating divergences. Okay, so some take home points from this part of the talk. We can accurately infer phylogenies with shared and multifurcating divergences with moderately sized data sets, like 50,000 base pairs is actually not, you know, 10 years ago, that was huge, but not anymore. It's quite easy to get data sets much larger than that. Um, generalizing tree space avoids the star tree paradox. So we avoid spur uh, spurious support for non-existent relationships. And it actually improved MCMC -MC mixing, which was a really pleasant surprise. Um, and when we applied this to the Gaconid lizards from across the Philippines, we're finding support. Um, for shared divergences that are predicted by the sea level changes, which is very interesting. Um, and one thing I just wanted to come back and comment on here is why are we seeing the shared divergences here and not when we looked at pairs of population? Well, when we approach this in a pairwise approach, we're really sort of limiting ourselves in the shared divergences that we can identify. So what we see in this tree is a lot of these shared divergences are sort of deeper in the relationships. So sort of ancestors of the current populations were involved in these shared divergences. Um, and we're, we're gonna miss those when we're only looking at pairs of populations. All right, so once again, um, we, took, we always take an open science approach to our work. So everything I just showed you, if you wanna see every single detail is available in those open science notebooks. All right. So I just briefly want to uh, talk about uh, where I see our work going um, over the next five years in our lab. And so I'm going to talk about four related projects. Um, and all of these are um, components of my career proposal, my NSF career proposal that's currently pending. So I'll talk a little bit about where I see the methods development in the theory going. And I'll talk about sort of two empirical um, motivations for that. So once again, geckos from Southeast Asia, no surprise there, um, but also um, looking at epidemiological dynamics of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'll also talk a little bit about um, incorporating coding to learn exercises into the prison courses that I teach to try to actually allow them to get involved in this research. <clears throat> okay, so first let's dive into the methods. So here is the current generalized tree distribution that I just showed you, right? And it seems to work um, quite well, but it isn't sort of inspired by biological processes. It's really born out of mathematical convenience. Um, and so but if we actually develop a process-based distribution, what that would allow us to do is we can actually learn about the macroevolutionary parameters that are controlling processes of, of diversification. Um, and so our goal is to port a lot of the algorithms in ecoevolity over to RevBase, which is another phylogenetic software package, and develop a generalized birth death model to serve as a distribution over this expanded tree space. <clears throat> and this is work in collaboration with Sebastian Hona um, at, and in Munich. So just very briefly, the basics of a birth death process is that we have some rate of speciation, a rate of extinction, and then some probability at which we sample um, species. Okay? And so with these parameters, we can derive the likelihood density for any, uh, any tree. But when I say any tree, that's any tree with independent bifurcating divergences. So what we wanna do is relax that assumption generalize the birth death uh, process into what we call a birth death burst process. And so we want to include burst events 
that occur at a given rate. And at these burst events, um, every lineage that crosses it has some probability of diverging. And what we want to do is actually allow these macroevolutionary parameters to vary depending on the characteristics of the lineages across the tree. And we'll, I'll get to that more when we talk about the empirical examples. And so we, what, what we want to do is Bayesian model averaging to infer the posterior set um, of trait dependent birth death burst models that best explain the data. Okay, and that's going to allow us to sort of uh, marginalize over the posterior samples in ways where we can test explicit hypotheses about trait dependent uh, diversification related to shared divergences. Okay, so I'm going to breeze over this, but this is just showing that we did correctly derive the density, the likelihood density of trees under this new model. So if we did it correctly, the purple and the green line should overlap. Basically, our math should match the simulation, and it does. <clears throat> okay, so one of the empirical motivations for this is the Certodactylus genus, which has almost 400 species distributed across South and Southeast Asia. Um, this genus um, is very diverse and ranges from generalist to microhabitat specialist. And what's really striking is the karst endemism in this group. So karst specific lineages have evolved are estimated to have evolved 24 times, and they comprise 25% of the species in the genus, despite um, karst formations making up a very tiny fraction of their distribution. And they really do show remarkable levels of microendemism um, on these karst formations. So I'll just show you an example. So this is a photo I took in Myanmar, uh, standing on top of a karst formation and looking out across the landscape. And so there's lots of areas in Southeast Asia that look something like this, where there's like archipelago of karst formations. And so what happened was when India slammed into, the, uh, slammed into Asia, it lifted up a bunch of marine limestone sediment. And then that sediment re relatively rapidly eroded um, and left, all that's left are these um, sort of karst towers. Um, that's all that's left, the rest has been eroded away. And so when you actually come to one of these karst formations and you walk inside, because it's usually you know, a, a cave system um, associated with it, and you look around, you often find a new species of bent-toed gecko um, that it occurs nowhere else in the world except on that one karst formation. So we want to know, so why do they have, why do we see such high levels of diversity and microendemism on karst? And so this is just recapping. So what happened is we had that uplift of limestone sediment and then it eroded away and fragmented the limestone into these karst formations. And um, a big part of this was the major river systems in um, Southeast Asia sort of carving their way through this limestone sediment. And so our hypothesis is if this fragmentation due to erosion, erosion was important uh, in generating the diversity and the endemism in this group, um, what we should see is an increased rate of shared divergences in karst adapted lineages specifically. Okay, so that's what we want to be able to test. How we're going to do that is we're going to get a bunch of, we have access to almost all the species in the genus, we're going to collect genomic data, and then we're going to apply a habitat dependent birth death burst model. So we're going to allow the um, birth, death, burst macroevolutionary parameters to depend on the habitat preference, um, and then do the Bayesian model averaging to get a posterior set of habitat-dependent models, and we can marginalize over that posterior to explicitly calculate the posterior probability that karst-dependent lineages have a higher rate of shared divergences. Maybe not necessarily a higher rate of divergences, but we want to know that they have a higher rate of shared divergences. Um, another empirical system that we want to apply this to is um, the pandemic. Um, and so we want to know sort of what's the relative contribution of social gatherings to the spread of the virus. And does this vary among the different variants of the virus? And do we see an effect of sort of human behavior on, on holidays? Okay, so the idea here is that um, 
threat at social gatherings predicts a particular pattern of divergences, right? So if multiple infected people spread the virus at a social gathering, it creates shared divergences in the transmission tree of the virus, right? So shared divergences in the transmission tree of the virus is a good proxy for spread at gatherings. So our plan is to apply a strain-dependent Earth death first model to the SARS-CoV-2 data. And so we're going to try to estimate a few things here. We're going to estimate the relative rate of shared divergences. So what's the relative rate of um, shared divergences, so a proxy for social gatherings, relative to independent divergences? And then we want to approximate the posterior probability that that varies among the different um, variants of the virus. And then um, we also want to sort of summarize the posterior and time slices to see if we can actually detect the an increase in um, shared divergence, the increase in the rate of shared divergence um, during uh, regional holidays. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, developing a new course, a new prison course. So I've been working with the Alabama, Alabama Prison Arts and Education Program over the last four years. So I teach evolutionary biology classes in prisons across Alabama. And what I wanna do is actually incorporate computers into the classroom by using um, these little tiny single board computers. Um, that's to get around the restrictions sort of imposed by the, the facilities. And so the idea is, is to um, have the students use graphical modeling software like SLIM to while we're learning about the processes of evolution, they can actually simulate them and actually get an intuition for how they work and interact. All right, and so then the capstone activity for this course is for them to design their own macroevolutionary scenario from the ground up with forward time population genetic simulations. So they're gonna simulate their own group of organisms, right? And then what we're gonna do is test, simulate, take those simulated data and evaluate how well phylogenetic methods um, estimate that history. Specifically, we wanna know how robust the, the new birth death first model is going to be when simulating data that's very different, that was generated under models very different from the ones uh, that it's assuming, right? So this is a very good proxy for real data, right? The, the lit, um, sort of the data sets they generate are only limited by their imagination, um, not by the birth death first model. All right, and the ultimate goal is that the students will co-author um, the papers that come from this. All right, lots of people to thank. Once again, my lab group is fantastic. I couldn't do any of this without them. Um,